emptiness and nothingness, which is somehow uh, somehow very pleasant. Even though there's nothing there, it's somehow very inviting. There's a story in the <coughs> book called Pratfalan, written by a Western monk in Thailand, and he was teaching English to some of the Thai people there. And he, he always used to ask them, part of his English lessons, he'd say, what's your favorite pastime or recreation? And they would all answer, sleeping. Number one, sleeping. Number two, going to the shopping center. <laughs> Interesting, isn't it, that kind of difference? Sleeping is the most pleasant thing, the most fun you can have. And there's something very innocent about that state of sleep. When we see people who are in a deep sleep, a deep dreamless sleep, they have this kind of, like a baby. All the kind of the weight of the years and the, the personality, the identity all of the constructs we make around ourselves and <clears throat> identify ourselves with all of these things slip away and there's just a kind of innocent peace. And then of course we um, from time to time the, the rhythms of our mind and body wake us up into dreams, a sort of a half sleep. And in that realm of dreams there's these kind of uh, ephemeral half knowings. We come from this kind of unknowing in the dream in the dreamless sleep to a state of almost semi-knowing, but where there's a very curious, uh, the boundaries are all blurred, boundaries between different uh, senses becomes blurred, sights become sounds or pictures become words or whatever it may be, images Emotions get evoked. Sometimes the dreams feel very trivial, they feel like there's nothing to them. Other times they can be very, there's a sense of profundity to them. You can wake up full of fear and terror, or you can wake up crying. <clears throat> One time Ajahn Brahm told me that he dreamt he had a, a samadhi nimitta and uh, it was so bright it woke him up and then he just sat up in his bed and just went into samadhi straight away. So you can even dream yourself into, <laughs> into samadhi, that's good isn't it? I'm sure you all go home and try that one out. Keep on trying, if it doesn't work the first time, you can always do it again. I knew some, had some supporters in Malaysia, they used to come to the monastery every day and offer dana. And <clears throat> a group of three sisters, and the eldest sister once said she had a problem in her meditation. I said, oh really? And she said, yes. I said, what's your problem? She said, well every night I lie down to sleep. And uh, I, I watch my breath coming in and out. 
When the breath goes in, the breath goes out, the mind follows it, and the breath becomes brighter and brighter, clearer and clearer, until my mind's just filled with this brightness and clarity and bliss. And I just lie there filled with light. And my whole my whole world turns into light and I'm just lying there filled with light all night and I can't get to sleep. <laughs> what can I do about this problem? <laughs> um, I said, well, um, do you feel tired the next day? She said, no, I feel fine. I said, no, I don't think it's such a big problem really. <laughs> um, So this world of dreams, we're not quite sure what to make of it, are we? We, we normally we uh, neglect it. We don't pay too much attention to our dreams. And sometimes the uh, psychologists and so on tell us that there's very deep meanings to be found in our dreams. And and sometimes it seems that there's very kind of elusive meanings to be found. But I guess we're not quite sure whether we're just chasing the meanings or the meanings are chasing us, which perhaps is the point of it all. And then, you know, when the night, night is over, draws to a close, then as the dawn comes, and uh, similarly, you know, just as the sky lights up when the dawn comes, similarly our, our mind wakes up, comes out of the darkness, as if perhaps our own minds are <coughs> echoing, reflecting, the patterns and the cycles of nature. And we also have like a dawning in our own mind, like a feeling where you're not awake and not asleep, and kind of a gradual sense of coming back. And it's a very interesting, quite a short period of time where you're starting to return to your consciousness. And that's interesting sometimes if you, you're, for example, you're staying in a, in a different place. Maybe you're traveling or sleeping somewhere that's not familiar. And it takes you a while to figure out exactly where you are. Or what time it is. Or what you're supposed to be doing. And so again, this like twilight zone of consciousness. And then <clears throat> you sort of wake up and... <clears throat> enter into what we call or what we think of as, as waking, the waking mind, the waking consciousness. But this waking consciousness is not a um, constant thing. It also has its own phases, its own cycles. And uh, you know, sometimes there's the rat-a-tat-tat of the thinking on and on and on. Kind of obsessive, you can't stop it. Uh, other times, there's this sense of, um, uh, can, and that, that that sense of thinking can be uh, can be can feel good or it can feel bad. You know, sometimes if you've kind of got hold of something that you're interested in, an idea you want to follow through, a story you want to tell yourself, uh, uh, something you want to work out, something that you need to reflect about. And then you, then it, it feels good. It feels positive to sort of work the mind in that way. Other times you haven't got anything you need to be doing, and the mind is just sort of incessantly going on, and it feels like uh, <coughs> it feels very painful. It feels kind of quite wearisome. The endless chatter. And then there's different kinds of periods and sometimes when the if mind feels more tired and lacking energy and you feel there's a sense of dullness. Other times there's a lot of zing to it. You feel very creative, very empowered. And sometimes you feel like there's there's nothing that you couldn't do, nothing that you couldn't take on, no challenge that you couldn't overcome. Other times you feel like you can't even lift your lift your head up. You can't even take another step. So 
there's different moods and phases that you go through. And then the <coughs> different uh, predominant kind of emotions can come in, like can very obvious ones like anger and annoyance. And you can see that sometimes happen when we get provoked. Maybe we're in our car and you know someone annoys us for the driving or something like that. Or maybe it's not provoked. Maybe we just you know get up in the morning and we feel angry and we haven't got anything to be angry about. And so we have to keep on making stuff up. We have to keep on telling ourselves really nasty stories about horrible people in order to sort of keep the anger flowing, keep the juices going. We can justify ourselves. And then of course the mind of lust, the mind of desire that keeps on circling around whatever it is that we want. Whether it's another person or uh, a thing a uh, material object or whatever it is that we want and our mind keeps on coming back to that and finds this sense of gratification in that thought uh, of that person or that food or that thing or that place or whatever it is. The song, the movie, keeps on coming back to that thing. It enjoys kind of rolling around in it, in the thought of that thing that we want. And then the mind of delusion, the mind that <coughs> gets confused and uh, the mind that just mixes stuff up. You know, the sense of delusion is, is um, it's very kind of hard to pin down, hard to notice, uh, but, but it's very strong actually. mind that keeps mistaking what's going on. The mind that doesn't get it. The mind that doesn't see that flow of cause and effect. And so there's always a kind of a worry associated with delusion. There's always a sense of uncertainty, this sense of... Um, like, where am I? What am I doing? You know, is this right or should I do it another way? And so it's quite a stressful place to be. So these things are all coming through the mind. And it's amazing how much it varies. These different phases and manifestations of our consciousness. This is the very stuff of our lives. This is the very fabric of our existence. This is what makes us human. Every day. From the day we're born to the day we die. These are the cycles, these are the events. This is what's going on. And this kind of story of this movement between waking and sleeping, dreaming, thinking, feeling, comprehending, all of these things that the mind does, affected and uh, influenced by <coughs> countless uh, different um, like uh, fields or networks of causality, whether it be external environment and the weather and the air and the sounds, whether it be um, our own, the state of our own body, our state of health and so on whether it be the people around us, their energy, their mood, our relationship with them, how well we get on with them or don't get on with them, how they affect us, the, the food that we choose to, uh, to consume with our mind, you know, the 
books and movies and media, uh, the things we like to look at, the things we like to taste, the things we like to touch, all of these things are kind of feeding our mind. And this is all influencing and changing how our mind is. The things we, we like to think about, those topics which um, come into the mind again and again and again, which the mind likes to play with, or which the mind doesn't like to play with but it can't leave alone, it likes to nag, it's, it's, it's kind of obsessing about. All of these things are creating this, the fabric of this world. And yet we feel like we, we pretend to ourselves. One of the great powers of delusion is that we pretend to ourselves that we're somehow the victim of our circumstances. We pretend to ourselves that we're the victim of our circumstances. We narrate ourselves a story in which we become subject to the inevitable um, <coughs> powers and uh, influences of other people. And we tell, us, tell ourselves these very convincing stories that uh, place us in a position of powerlessness. All of which is um, trying to avoid that very stark and, and um, awful truth. Awful in the, in the old sense of the word awful, as in inspiring of awe, inspiring of reverence. Like this word awe is like a combination between reverence and terror. So this truth, which is this both both reverence and terror of this fact that actually it's our choice. It's what we want to do. It's where we've put ourselves. It's how we think. That's what determines the quality of our lives. Everything else is detail. I remember when I was quite new to <coughs> Buddhism and I arrived at Wat Nanachat in Thailand as a layman and uh, at that time, soon after I arrived, there was a large group of uh, a Christian group, young people who'd come, were travelling through and they wanted to visit the monastery and learn a little bit about Buddhism and so some of us met with them one evening and we just talked about our different perspectives and different takes on religion. So this is my first interfaith encounter. And uh, we had a very nice evening, talked about different, you know, different things. And uh, what I mainly remember is right at the end, one of the group from the Christian group says, well, you know, in the end, you know, really you guys are saying just the same thing as we are, that, that, you know, we just have to depend on somebody else to come and save us, and we're waiting for our saviour to come. And all the Buddhists in the group just kind of looked at each other and said, what's <laughs> It's a bit of a waste of time. No, just in case you're wondering, that's not Buddhism. That's not what the Buddha was teaching. But it's just so hard... It's so hard to deal with life without that sense of a saviour, that sense of a, a comforter, the sense of somebody who's going to just 
hold you and say, it's okay. And so even though in Buddhism we we try to give these things as best we can. <clears throat> and this is something where uh, early Buddhism sometimes is misunderstood and mischaracterized. They use this word Hinayana, which means literally the rubbish vehicle. They, 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 um, they try to pretend that it means little vehicle, but that's not true. Anyone who knows Sanskrit or Pali would know that Hinayana means, Hina means inferior. It literally means something that's been thrown away. So like rubbish or crap. So the crappy vehicle. So this is what other people call early Buddhism. Some people. And the reason they give it that name is because they allege that it's selfish, that people are only concerned with their own well-being and don't care about others. And so in saying that, they make a very serious conceptual blunder about what the Buddha was actually teaching. <clears throat> Of course the Buddha was teaching us that we need to care about each other. Of course he was teaching us that loving kindness is one of the most beautiful and important qualities that we can remember that we can we can develop and have in our lives. Of course he was teaching us of the value of spiritual community. A very famous occasion when his favorite the Buddha's favorite disciple Ananda came to him and said you know Bhante I think that uh, good friendship is half of the spiritual life and the Buddha said don't say that Ananda don't say that in fact good friendship is the whole of the spiritual life this is how important that the Buddha felt it our sense of community and sharing and, and supporting each other. That support is not based on belief. We don't, uh, in Buddhism, we don't have a sense of I respect you, I care for you, I give you a sense of value and worth because of what you believe. Now, I've been reflecting a little, about, a little bit about this recently. You know, it seems to me that in the world that we have today that, that this is perhaps the greatest uh, heresy that we have to overcome. You know, we're used to talking about racism and sexism and so on, these kinds of discrimination. We need to maybe have an, invent another word, creedism. I'm going to discriminate against you because of what you believe. People who believe in tenets X, Y, Z are good and right and true and proper and full human beings and they're going to go to heaven and be saved forever. And people who believe in tenets A, B and C are bad and evil and nasty and they're going to go to hell forever. And so this idea of reifying our beliefs so that our humanity can be summed, the level of development of our humanity can be summed up by our adherence to a set of beliefs. And so in, in English we call a religion, we call a belief, a faith, a creed. And none of these words are vaguely adequate in a Buddhist context, of course. In Buddhism, of course, we have faith, we have belief, we have creed, but we don't define ourselves by that. We define ourselves by a commitment to awakening. This is what it means to be Buddhist. And so that sense of uh, caring and helping in Buddhism doesn't come from the fact that we have the same beliefs as another person, it comes from 
and appreciation of suffering, appreciation that just as we feel pain, also that other person feels pain. Just as we feel happiness, also they feel happiness. Just as we can have our heart broken so easily, so too they can have their heart broken just as easily. And when we appreciate this, then this is something that brings us together, brings all humanity together. And not just humanity, all beings, whether animals, invisible beings, whatever there is, it doesn't matter. We don't have to argue about what kinds of beings there are, or are there gods, or are there different realms of being and so on. It doesn't matter. If they're there, we can love them. If they're not there, oh well, it doesn't hurt anyway. It's not what we believe. It's what we feel. So this is this imperative for us to develop as part of our spiritual practice. This emotional development that knows the extent of suffering and knows to treat others always with kindness and respect. No matter if they're Buddhist, non-Buddhist, whatever. We treat them with kindness, treat them with respect and try to... Whatever we can, whatever we can do, we do. So this is like one side of it. The other side of it is the understanding that what we can do is limited. It's understanding that we can't save people. Even the Buddha has said, it's not possible for me to carry another across the flood. It's not possible. This is just a fact of life. This isn't an emotional attitude towards that. And this is what, again, is, is misunderstood with this thing of, of Hinayana. It's not that we're saying we don't care whether you get saved or not. We don't care whether you suffer or not. We don't care whether you're happy or not. It's that we recognize that the roots of our problems lie within our own hearts. And there's only a limited amount that we can actually do. And so we do that. We do that limited amount. We help each other. We teach each other. We advise each other. We support each other. We, we're there to lend a helping hand to each other. We're there to lend a sympathetic ear when that's needed. We do everything we can. And don't hold back. But while, as we do that, we know that it's only a tiny little bit. It's only a tiny little bit. <clears throat> One time somebody asked Adhan Chah about... Um, they said that there were people in Western countries who specialized in teaching meditation for people who were dying. And so they'd go and see them when they're on their deathbed and and teach them and, and try to help them to meditate and be mindful. And uh, while, while they went through that phase, and, and somebody asked Ajahn Chah, what did he think about this? And uh, he said, of course, it's a, it's a very good thing to do. He said, but you know, you've got to put it into perspective. He said, his comparison was, he said, it's like if a man is standing in a river of lava up to his waist... flowing molten rock up to his waist. And you give him a lolly and say, here, this will take your mind off the pain. <laughs> so you still give him the lolly. yeah, Because that's what you can do. But you don't fool yourself and thinking that that's somehow going to solve the problem. It's just what you can do, that's all. And so in Buddhism we have this kind of realistic assessment of us, both our inner consciousness and our relationship with others. Both of them are important. Both of them are essential. Can't neglect our, our, our sense of community, our sense of relationship with others. Can't pretend that that's not important. 
And yet, important as that is, crucial as that is, vital as that is, when it all comes home, we're alone. When we look into our mind, we see what this consciousness is. It's alone. It's not shared with others. Of course, it's influenced by others. It's affected by others. But that actual feeling, that actual experience inside here, I'm experiencing alone. And nobody else can share that. And so we have to own up to this. We have to be responsible for what's going on in this world, this world inside. We have to realize that through all these changes in consciousness, through all these <coughs> movements and uh, rhythms and cycles, at every stage, at every moment, we can handle that with quality and with care. No matter where we're at, no matter if we're tired, no matter if we're angry, no matter if we're distracted, no matter if we're confused, whatever we're at, we can bring a sense of quality to that. We can bring a sense of dignity to that. We can... Um, uh, have a sense of comprehension which will understand the context and be able to act, use our mind, respond in an appropriate way for that context. This is what training of the mind is about. One way of training the mind is through meditation. Another way through talking with others, through doing things, through doing work. All the different things we do in our day each one of them gives us another opportunity for training our mind in a different way. For using our awareness in a different way. And so we should never uh, neglect the opportunity <coughs> to try to um, uh, enhance or improve the quality of our awareness, the quality of our understanding, at any moment.